First of all, I wanted to ask you how good or how bad do you think cognitive science is in terms of uh, the shape it is nowadays. Yet, uh, last year, Rafael Nunez published a paper criticizing the progress that cognitive science in the singular term had uh, made or had not made actually, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, saying that uh, the original goals that cognitive science uh, put out and uh, but had not been attained, basically, you know? Well, what were the original goals? I was there when it got started, but mm -hmm. the only original goals I remember were to try to understand something about how our metal processes work. Uh, George Miller, Jerry Brewer, Right, right. I mean, they had some ideas, but uh, no specific goals that I recall. I mean, there were uh, some who had uh, uh, very uh, ambitious uh, uh, expectations, people like Marv Minsky, for example, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think any of us took that very seriously. <laughs> what about it's Simon and Newell? Simon and Newell had some interesting ideas, but uh, you know the logic program was useful but very limited, it doesn't tell us much about thinking. It's a hard problem, and it's unusually hard because, uh, uh, you know, it's, say in the field of vision, you can learn a lot by experimentation, invasive experimentation with other organisms. So we know a lot, for example, about the neurophysiology of vision by experiments with cats and monkeys. But when you get to uh, uh, areas where the, the, the humans are basically unique, you can't do any, don't have any comparative uh, evidence to speak of. So language, there's no analog, so you can't do, I mean, you can think of lots of possible experiments you could do with humans that would give you a lot of insight, but you just can't do them. And you can't do them with other animals because they don't have the capacity. Right. So you have to, it's a very hard problem. You have to look around the periphery. Right, and that's what you say in your book. Uh, I show you uh, on Tuesday, um, and precisely because of that limitation, there are some new, well, rather new paradigms in cognitive science. In cognitive science, after the uh, the computationalist approach, you know, then came the connectionist approach, and then the inactive or uh, embodied approach. So, what what do you think of these new approaches, like the um, embodiment and inactivism? I don't think it tells you anything. I mean, the fact is, something's going on up here. And of course, there's all kind of connections to the rest of the body, but they're peripheral to it. So like when we're talking, I move my arms, you know, uh, all sorts of things are happening, but they're just reflections of what's going on in the head. I don't think they, I, I don't know of any real results that come out. Well, there are some studies that link in an intrinsic manner body body gestures, you know, and meaning. So if you are really mad and you're expressing... But that we know without cognitive science. I mean, so if you hear the... You know, there's experiments showing that uh, if you have a, a sentence like uh, uh, the car hit, a, hit the bus uh, and compare it with the horror, smash the bus, you'll get a different reaction, uh, response time, things like that. But those are not, uh, those, those studies should be studies, uh, should be understood as studies of whether the experimental technique works. 
I mean, if you take, say, the difference between smash and hit, uh, we know th what the difference is. Uh, we can measure it in many ways. Uh, we can try to construct an experiment which will give the right result. If it does, it was a useful, it was a proper experimental technique. If it doesn't, we just disregard the experimental technique. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get experimental techniques that work on the uh, obvious cases where you know the answer, then you can maybe use them on non-obvious cases. But the particular test of, say, smash versus hit is not discovering anything about the mind. It's discovering whether the experimental technique works and if it's useful for something else. Mm -hmm. So it's a test of the experimental technique. And uh, a lot of the work that's done is like that. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, we get a result, but if it's the wrong result, we throw out the experiment. I mean, every experimenter knows uh, it's very hard to get a good experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, most of your tries, turns out, didn't get to the right thing. You know, an experiment, of, after all, is kind of like a theory. It's an idealization. It says, I want to look at this piece of the world and disregard everything else, which is very much what a theory does. Right. So whether it's a good experiment is whether it's like a good theory. Right? So the work within co cognitive science sh should be limited to, to, to doing that, or there is room for conceptual work as well? Oh, well, like uh, every other science is the same. You take a look at, uh, I mean, remember, cognitive science is in an early stage. It's like uh, physics in the 17th century. Uh, the great results in physics in the 17th century were thought experiments. Uh, most of Galileo's experiments, you can't, are physically impossible. Or if you take, go further to say Mendel's experiment, it's now known that he couldn't have gotten the results he did. Hmm. It's statistically almost impossible. So he got something, and the something was important and then he refined it to show what should happen under perfect conditions, which is valuable, but it's uh, an interaction of uh, theoretical understanding and uh, data attained by experiment. And virtually everything is like that. And do you think that it's feasible to work in with uh, together several disciplines as we pretend to? bring together anthropology, linguistics, psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience to, to be productive? It, you know, the disciplinary boundaries are kind of arbitrary. No reason to take them pretty seri very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, they're for administrators in universities. But as far as research is concerned, you deal with the issue. If something from chemistry happens to be relevant, God will use that. Uh, things do sort of converge. So studies in vision, studies in language, studies in social interaction, uh, uh, st studies in, uh, let's say, political structures, they all are pretty much different. But uh, uh, there's no reason to be trapped by the name of the discipline, right. especially in the case of philosophy. Mm -hmm. After all, until the 19th century, uh, philosophy was just everything. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And do you think philosophy can or should be sensitive to experimental work? It's Some people relevant to the philosophical concerns, sure. Well, that's the thing. Some people think that philosophy is only about conceptual analysis and there is no room for empirical work. Well, you can define it that way if you want, but... Uh, I don't agree myself, but... It's not a matter of agreement. It's a matter of decision. You can say, I just want to study the conceptual work, okay? your business, but you can't appropriate the term philosophy for that. Mm -hmm. There's certainly no historical basis for it. I mean, like I say, the term science in English at least wasn't uh, even used in the modern sense until William Ewell, Ewell mid-19th century. Mm -hmm. In German, it's still not used. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, Wissenschaft. It's everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> what about um, experience? I, I haven't read much about you talking about experience, you know, 
And we know that at least in the continental tradition, there is phenomenology that's the study of experience. Do you think there is room for or in, there should be interest in studying experience as such as part of cognition or in the mind? Pretty careful about the concept experience. Uh, we're not presented with experience. Experience is a mental construct. Uh, so take the simplest things. Uh, uh, I look at him and say, my experience is a person is sitting there. But actually, the data that's coming to me is just spots of light at various points in my retina. Everything else my mind is constructing. And it's constructing it on the basis of all kind of background uh, information, understanding, perceptions. And when I look at this thing, I see a round table, but that's certainly not what my retinal image is. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like that. In fact, this all goes back to discussions by Descartes. Uh, Descartes pointed out that uh, you know the neo-scholastic views that he was criticizing held that if you look at a triangle, uh, the triangle, the, fo the form of the triangle moves through the air and implants itself in your brain. And Descartes pointed out simply he used the analogy of a blind man with a stick. This is a blind man with a stick can go around the edge and perceive a triangle. He didn't know it, but that's pretty much the way our eyes work. It's the saccadic eye motions are just going all over the place. And stimuli are coming to the eye, reconstructing something. And you do it very quickly. So I'm sure you know one of the most striking results, now, not new, is that uh, uh, with a, if you just have a couple of dots on a tachistoscopic presentation, and you give a series of them. So you're just seeing three dots here, then three dots here, and three dots here quickly. And what you actually see is a rigid object in motion. You're constructing everything from inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, experience is a high level construct. It's not that you can describe, you can report it if you like, but you're reporting some very complex events that yep. involve the interaction of. Uh, external events and what your mind is doing with them. And what your mind is doing with them can involve many factors, uh, including your own personal history, what you're going to do. Sure. The idea is to, for me, I mean, the question really comes to whether, rele whether experience is a relevant construct or concept that somehow constrains the descriptions that we can do at, at another level. Well, since experience is a construct, a lot of our theoretical work will show that experience is not representing the outside world. So let's just say the moon illusion. Your experience is the moon is huge, but our science tells us, no, it's not. It's something that you're constructing in your mind. So sure, you can describe experience, but you're describing a high-level construct that you want to, if you want to understand it, you're going to have to distinguish between the external stimuli and the actions of the mind which construct experience. Right, right. So you're already deep into cognitive science. It's not that experience is something immediate. Mm. It's, it's not immediate. It's highly uh, abstract and constructed. Right. Yeah, well, very interesting issues. We don't have time to, to, develop, and, uh, to develop them, unfortunately, but... Uh, but I understand what you're saying. Um, and in the same uh, vein, do you think there is a role for neuroscience? Because neurosciences have become very fashionable. You know, they talk even about neuroethics and neurotheology. But what about neuroscience in cognitive science? I mean, there's a lot of exaggeration about neuroscience, a lot of propaganda and PR. So after uh, neuroscience is certainly a valuable discipline and you can learn things from it, but you're not going to learn anything about ethics. I mean, after all, what is the information we're getting from studies of the brain? And we're finding that the blood flow is faster here than it is here. It's interesting, but I'm not going to say anything about ethics. <laughs> of course. But they... I mean, again, these are cases where you can imagine experiments, 
Like if you could do invasive experiments in deeper parts of the brain, the way they're done, say, in the striate cortex, in mice or cats, yeah, then you could learn things. But you can't do these experiments. Um, in humans, yes. A little work being done by actually picking up from something like uh, Penfield did many mm. years ago, now regarded as unethical. But uh, a study of uh, a, 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 an open brain during surgery, by now there are ways of doing it which are plausibly within ethical limits, and it uh, enables you to see what a single neuron is doing while the patient is alive and functioning. And you can get some information about that, but it's very superficial. Mm -hmm. In fact, you want to get a sense of what it's like. There was a, an issue of some, the journal Science was devoted to the neuroscience of language about a couple of months ago. If you look, it never got beyond. The farthest it got was saying something about two two word phrases. That's it. Almost nowhere. Then you're getting very little about that. It's hard. There are some real results. Like there's a, the most important result, I think, is uh, by a group in uh, Italy, uh, Milan. The linguist involved is Andrea Moro. Uh, they, uh, like everything that's serious, it was guided theoretically. Um, there's a lot of linguistic evidence now that uh, all the operations of language the structural operations, the ones that feed the uh, semantic interpretation, are uh, what are called structure dependent. They ignore the linear order of words right. and just use abstract structures, which is a pretty striking result. Because what, and this is with children. This has now been demonstrated now to about thirty months old, which means essentially no experience. Right. Uh, but what it means is that the child is ignoring 100% of what it hears and is paying attention only to what it never hears because you don't hear abstract structures. So that's a pretty surprising result. We now have a good explanation for it. But the, uh, the, uh, uh, these results suggested to Andrea Moro, the linguist in the group, that uh, they try to see with... Uh, uh, it take, the experimental design takes... Uh, monolingual speakers of, uh, I think it was German in their case, and uh, devise artificial languages, some of uh, which are modeled in one set, they're modeled on a language they don't know, like Italian. So put in some of the rules of Italian in an uh, in invented system. The other set is just use rules that violate the principles of language. Like, for example, rules that do use linear order. So, for example, in one set, uh, uh, you would have a rule where negation, let's say, works the way it does in Italian, which is a pretty complicated set of rules. Uh, in the other set, uh, negation would just be, say, the third word in, a, in the sentence. Very trivial complication. Right and ask how the monolingual speakers of German handle these two cases. Turns out there's striking differences. And the one modeled on a language they don't know, you get activation in the usual language areas, Broca's area and so on. And the other, you get just diffuse brain activity, meaning people are treating it as a puzzle. So when they're getting a simple system, find the third word treat it as a puzzle, not as a language. Mm -hmm. uh, this is duplicated by some psycholinguistic studies. There's, uh, do you know Neil Smith? No. Nope. British uh, linguist, psycholinguist. He's been working for years with a, uh, an int a subject, uh, calls him Chris, who uh, has amazing linguistic capacity. He learns languages in no time, you know, picks up a grammar book, studies it, knows the language has no cognitive capacities at all. Uh, he can't remember where his bedroom is, he has to be oh. taken to it, you know, uh, can do almost nothing. But the, but, a, but a kind of a idio savon, you know. And uh, they tried this with Chris, and on the 
uh, systems modeled on a language, he learned it very quickly. Uh, the ones that were used linear order, he could do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just, since it's a puzzle, he can't solve it. Right. Uh, wow. So uh, results like that are mm -hmm. interesting to find the, you know, just it just shows that there is a detectable neural basis for strange properties of language, which is worth knowing. This has now been replicated quite a lot. So there are some things like that. Mm -hmm. But notice that they're really not teaching you anything about language. They're just verifying that in another domain, the domain of the brain sciences, you can see that something's going on related to this. But to find out what's actually happening in the computations of the brain is very difficult. And in mm -hmm. fact, most of the computational models, the kind you were talking about, the connectionism and so on, they all assume neural net models. But there's very good reason to believe that neural nets are not the appropriate model for the brain. Uh, one reason actually goes back to Helmholtz. Uh, neural transmission is very slow, nowhere near fast enough for what we do. If you just introspect on your thinking, let's say, uh, you, know, you walk into a room, uh, somebody walks into this room, sees you, and realizes, recognizes you, say, uh, something I wanted to tell him, but then they notice me and they say, I better not say it because he's not going to like it. So then you say something. Else. All of this happens in a microsecond. Right. Uh, There's no time. Way faster than neural transmission. And it's happening all the time. You're constantly making complex decisions. And when you talk to your, you know, you, th you think in words, you're not producing the sentences, at least consciously. You're just getting bits and pieces of fragments of it and somehow it all comes together, and, and it's happening so fast that it's way beyond the speed of neural computation. Mm -hmm. So there must be deeper computation going on, maybe down even to the cellular level. Same sort of memory. There's no way for our memories to be stored in the brain. Mm -hmm. They just don't have the compute, not by neuron, neural nets at least. Mm -hmm. They just don't have that capacity. So this, you know, we, we know, I mean, you know, deep learning is all based on this. And it's useful, technically, but it's not giving any real insight into anything. Into language. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the ethical issues, <coughs> do you think it makes any sense to say that we, we one day we will naturalize ethics or morality? Does it, because <laughs> well, there's... I mean, there's descriptive work, which kind of, in a way, naturalizes ethics. Uh, the experimental work by, uh, actually it was started really by a very good young philosopher, John Mikhail, I don't know if you know him, he I've heard of did a dissertation about 10 or 15 years ago. It was, uh, it started with a, a critical analysis of uh, Rawls's work. Rawls's early work was based on a grammatical model. Mm -hmm. uh, he got so much criticism. I, I knew him. I was working with him at the time. He got so much criticism from philosophers, he just dropped that part and went ahead with the other part. But John mm -hmm. uh, picked it up again and pointed out that it was well-designed and just right. He pursued it and uh, uh, tried to develop a kind of quasi-grammatical theory of moral judgment. But then he went on with Elizabeth Spelke uh, to do uh, experimental work with young children to see if he could account for their moral judgments as, uh, as essentially theorems of this moral grammar. Uh, this was then picked up by other people, especially Mark Hauser, a cognitive psychologist, who uh, did uh, studies with children, but also comparative studies, other cultures. And we're able to get some interesting results about uh, non-trivial generalizations about moral judgments seem to be instinctive uh, with some theoretical framework of the Mikhail type to try to uh, organize and uh, uh, develop a computational system that will account for them. Uh, I think that kind of work is productive, but trying to find the neural basis for it is fiendishly difficult. You can't even do it for simple things. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's like people asking, uh, how come you can't find a gene for language? I mean, you can't find a gene for height. <laughs> Nothing you can find it for. These are very, com even the simplest things are very complex. After all, nobody even knows uh, how the, the gen genome uh, provides provides the product the uh, you know production system the system that creates an organism uh, we know that genes determine protein folding but how do you go from that to an organism it's way out of range hmm. so I think the expectations for cognitive neuroscience go are, are it is totally unrealistic you can't even deal with simple traits in those terms Okay. Even, well, even with animals, where you can do the experimentation. So trying to figure out how, say, uh, an insect navigates, nobody understands the neuroscience of that. Uh, a bee has a, you know, a brain the size of a grass seed, uh, very quick gestation period. You've got hundreds of species. Uh, perfect. You can do any experiment you like. But it's just too hard. So how are you going to figure out how humans make moral judgments? Mm, that's a stretch. <laughs> yeah. uh, and now turning into language, uh, something that I would like to know is uh, when I was in France studying, uh, I was uh, very keen on Wittgenstein's uh, philosophy, especially his second the philosophy. Late, the late philosophy. The late philosophy, yes, of Wittgenstein. But I haven't heard you or read, I mean, as, as far as I remember, anything about Wittgenstein. So do you think, what's, what's the use of the late Wittgenstein in your own view? Is there any for pragmatics and cognition? Uh, back in the 1960s, I, I did have an article on the, the uh, Wittgenstein's uh, approach to language acquisition, mainly in the blue and brown books. So I had a critical discussion in that. I don't think that amounts to anything. But the general idea that uh, if you want to understand uh, the meaning, you should look at how things are used is a valuable idea. And it carried forward, I think, in more effective ways in many respects by some of the ordinary language philosophers, especially John Austin. Right. His work, I think, was very sophisticated. Right. written about it much, but use it, yeah. Okay. Actually, Austin himself was extremely, who I knew, was very much interested in generative grammar. He was, in fact, uh, teaching syntactic structures in his seminar right before he died. I like very much John Austin's work on perception. He's a very smart guy. Yes, yes. Um, you talk about the, um, some language of thought in that book I told you about, I showed you. Is that Similar or the same, pretty, pretty much the same view as Fodor's uh, language of thought, or different? Well, Fodor, without going to detail, personal it. friend, it never really said anything about the language of thought. I mean, take a look at it; it's, it's basically English. Yeah. Now, the fact of the matter is that a, a generative grammar of a particular language, say English, does yield uh, something like a language of thought. That is, it determines the, if it's done right, it'll determine the semantic interpretation of every one of an infinite number of expressions. Well, each of those semantic interpretations is basically a thought, a linguistically artic articulated thought. So there is that language of thought. The question is, and if in fact the internal systems of languages are all fundamentally the same, seems very likely. It seems that the differences among languages are mainly in the externalization, you know, how you map the internal system into the sensory motor system one or another way. But uh, it's very unlike the, the linear order case is an example. I mean, that's all added in the externalization. It's not really part of language. I mean, the only reason you use linear order is because your articulatory system requires that, can't produce structures. In fact, if you use sign, they use somewhat different outputs. You can do things simultaneously. 
So what, but these are all about the sensory motor system, which is not part of language. Uh, from an evolutionary point of view, it was there millions of years before language ever appeared. It's totally, and it hasn't been affected by language. So uh, the uh, internal systems, you can't prove it yet, but I think work is converging towards uh, indicating that the internal systems are probably uniform or very close to it. Well, if that's the case, then the language of thought produced by each language is essentially the same. So it's a broader human, a, a human a specific language of thought. Now, Jerry Fodor wants something broader than that. He wants a system which will integrate what comes out of language with what comes from the visual system. Oh, I see. But you're pretty close to that when you have the uh, internal system and you understand the concepts that are enter, enter into it. So the concept round, for example, which applies to this, uh, even though I, what, I, what I see on my retina is some strange kind of ellipse. You know. So the question is, is there really anything beyond this? It's not very clear to me. Mm -hmm. So maybe the language of thought is just what's coming out of uh, uh, our the linguistic system. Uh, the, if you look at the history, that's kind of a traditional view. So, uh, von Humboldt, for example, simply identified thought and language. Others didn't go quite that far. Right. But, but regarded uh, language as just an you know, audible thought. William Dwight Whitney. That's basically the tradition. I think there's probably mm. something to it. Something that we acquired probably 200,000 years ago? or. Not, not much well, longer, right? Seems to be so. I mean, we now have genomic evidence that shows that uh, humans, Homo sapiens, began to separate at least 150,000 years ago, which is not very long after uh, uh, Homo sapiens, anatomically modern humans, appear. And as far as anybody knows, they all have the same language faculty. It's interestingly, slightly different externalizations. Uh, you know, Rini Hoiberg's uh, Dutch linguist has a very interesting article, I can send it to you if you like, in which he, uh, he showed pretty convincingly that the first groups that separated uh, the San people in Africa uh, are all and only the, lang the, speak the languages that use clicks, elaborate click systems. So it he suggests that the externalization developed after the split, though the internal systems were already in place. It's a pretty hard argument to make because uh, there's also evidence that externalization is immediate. The evidence comes from uh, uh, infant, uh, infants who have uh, deaf, deaf children whose parent from speaking parents uh, who uh, just are, say, play together, a group of cousins play together, but they've never, they have no linguistic input, especially because the parents are indoctrinated in the oralist uh, tradition, which says you're not allowed to make gestures if the parents walk around like this, and all, mm. which is totally insane, but uh, <laughs> it's a strong tradition. People don't do it anymore, but they did it at some time. So there are cases of small groups of kids, like a group of cousins, let's say, who play together, have no linguistic input. Uh, they develop their own sign language, but it's externalized. Now, as far as we know, uh, there has been no evolution of the language faculty for a couple hundred thousand years. So these kids are presumably the same as the ones 100 to 200,000 years ago, but they're externalizing right away, which means their ancestors presumably were as well. Now, it could be that this is related to the fact that they're in a society where they just see people interacting, even if they don't know how they're doing it. And maybe that stimulates the, uh, the process. You can't know. That. This is one of the cases where you could carry out experiments, except you're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine lots of experiments that tell you quite a lot. <laughs> Oh,
Oh, oh, oh, oh. 